Let's pray. Lord God, what a joy it is to be bound to you. You have been so gracious to every one of us. Lord, I'm so grateful this morning to see everybody here and just be able to come together as your body again. Lord, you have called us. You have blessed us. You keep us. You watch over us. Everything we are is from your hand, Lord. We're so grateful. And Lord, we thank you for Nick and his willingness to bring the message this morning. Pray that you would be with him, guide him, direct him, and help us to sit at your feet and to learn from you, Lord. For you do want us to have abundant joy and abundant life. You have given us everything. So Lord, help us to focus on you even now and to look to you for your direction and help us to be the encouragement to each other and to you that we need to be, Lord. Glory be to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Oh, Christ in me made me a little emotional. Yeah. Great song. Great job, man. What a blessing it is to have such a worship team that you have here across the morning. Open up your Bibles, if you would, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. The title of today's message is The Kindness of God. I was the recipient of a random act of kindness about two years ago. Uh, during lunchtime, I went to a place called the Red Fox Grill on the corner of 6th Street and Sycamore in downtown Cincinnati. And I went in there, and you can see by the guest check there, I ordered a cheeseburger deluxe and some french fries. And as I pulled my car out and went to pay, the man said, I'm sorry, we don't take car, we only accept cash. And I said, ah. Oh, this can't be so. So I put my card back in my pocket, disappointed I wasn't going to have that cheeseburger. And then just at that moment, this young man came in and he said, I got that. And he paid for my burger and my fries. And the next thing you know, he was out the door and gone. And I kept that because that came at a very important time in my life where I was feeling very low very down. And that random act of kindness right there really kind of, it gave me the feeling that God was with me. And that God was seeing me through this battle. So I kept that and I pasted it inside my Bible and it reminds me all the time that God's kindness is all around us and always there. Let's read this passage of scripture 2 Samuel chapter 9 and we'll see today how King David demonstrated the kindness of God. Verse 1 says this. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Seba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Seba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Seba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Seba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. The king, then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, Here is your servant. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. And you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Then King Saul's servant, Seba, the king called him and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth 
your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Seba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Seba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Seba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, where he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame, both feet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you first of all for your passionate kindness and your loving kindness which endures forever. Father, teach us to be kind like you toward others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now the principle that we are going to be discussing today and that I want you to take from this is that King David demonstrated the kindness of God. The kindness that God shows towards us and the kindness that God desires for us to show others. So the question that we should ask ourselves here this morning is, am I demonstrating the kindness of God for others? Let me just set up this, the background of this passage here. This event takes place around 995 B.C., roughly about a thousand years before Christ is introduced as the Messiah and the Savior to the world. We're about eight years into the reign of King David. And things are looking pretty good right now. He has successfully united the kingdoms, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. He was the king, made king over Israel. While Saul's son was made king of the northern tribes, David battled through and finally fulfilled the call that he was anointed with by Samuel to be the king over all of Israel. So David is firmly entrenched right now as the king, and he's enjoying a time of prosperity. You could say that this is kind of the golden age of his reign, where he has fulfilled the call and things are finally settling in. He has made Jerusalem the capital of Israel. But it wasn't always easy for the young lad. He battled King Saul, who tormented him, all before he was able to reach the throne. Saul desperately wanted to kill King David because he was jealous that God had anointed him to be the next king due to Saul's betrayal. So now David is on a conquest. Finally has the time to be able to fulfill the promise that he made to Jonathan. Now, Jonathan was the son of King Saul. So it's really rather amazing that David and Jonathan were able to keep this relationship that they had. A very special friendship. Because with Jonathan being the son of Saul, it would have been easy for Jonathan to jump ship and go against David. But he didn't. He maintained that friendship. And he said, David, when you finally become king, I want you to make a promise to me. I want you to promise that you will treat my descendants well. And so David now is getting ready to fulfill that promise. So let me speak briefly now about this man, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan and the grandson of King Saul. Now, Mephibosheth was lame in both his feet, as the scripture says there. And that happened as a result of an accident. Um, he was dropped after uh, being told that his son, or that his father and his grandfather were killed in battle. So we're at a time right now where both Jonathan and Saul are dead. And that's why David is fulfilling his promise. <clears throat> Mephibosheth was to be the rightful recipient and heir of all that King Saul had. But he was deceived by Seba. Seba was the servant of Saul. And so being lame in this culture was a sign that you were cursed by God. So it was easy for Seba with his many sons, 15 and 20 servants, to cast Mephibosheth off to the side and kind of keep the goods for himself. And that's exactly what happened. And 
So this is where we're at in this. David is about to demonstrate the goodness and the kindness of God to this man, this man who is lame, this man who has been deceived, and this man who considers himself what in the scripture say? A dead dog. A dead dog. <laughs> Let me speak briefly about the kindness of God. Now God is kind because God is always good. There is no evil in God. He is incapable of any evil at all. Now, kindness comes from one of God's moral attributes. You know the, the non-moral attributes of God, that he is, of course, all-powerful, that he is immutable, unchanging, that he is ever-present, and that he is all-knowing. Those are the non-moral attributes of God. Now, the moral attributes of God are those things like kindness, goodness, benevolence, mercy, forgiveness, love. Those are the things that we hold dearly to. His holiness. And so the kindness of God is one of those moral attributes. Now, this kindness that God has extends to all creation. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. God is always kind. And for us to draw closer to God, I would strongly advise not getting caught up in the theology, not trying to get head knowledge, but pursue the heart of God. Mm -hmm. And to always know that before you start in any passage of Scripture, that God is love and God never does any evil. And you say, well, didn't God flood the earth with a global flood and kill nearly all mankind? Didn't God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with balls of fire? Well, yes, he did. And those were acts of mercy. And those were good acts because God preserved humanity. Without God's intervention in the course of humanity, mankind always works and seeks to destroy itself. Without God's intervention, there would be no mankind. We would cease to exist. And that goes against God's desire to have a large family in heaven whom he can share his love with and who will reciprocate that love to him. So all those controversial passages of the scripture should mm -hmm. be easily explained by a loving and merciful God who has no evil in him and is always seeking the best for mankind. And that is the kindness that God demonstrates to us and that David demonstrates to Mephibosheth here. David begins his quest to show the kindness of God by first forgiving. <clears throat> he forgives. Before he can keep his promise, he has to forgive. But what does he forgive? He forgives King Saul. King Saul chased him all over the land looking to slay him. In fact, one day, David's playing his harp, and King Saul takes a spear and tries to shove it right through his heart. And David's like, whoa! Gets out of the way, is able to escape, and is able to carry on. Aren't you glad that we have a God who has forgiven us? Yes. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who is able to look past our faults and has forgiven us? And this needs to be said. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He willingly took the curse of our sin and took the penalty of our sin and allowed himself to be hung on a cross <laughs> and crucified. And then he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, securing for you and I the opportunity to have salvation and experience the kindness of God in fullness and to have a place where we can witness God's love for all eternity. The gospel. What a beautiful thing. You know, and God desires for us to share the forgiveness that we've experienced with others. 
after David is able to forgive, he is then off to keep his promise. David keeps his promise to Jonathan that he made to treat his descendants well and to not cut his house off forever. How many promises are in the Bible? <clears throat> Boy, I don't know. I went on a quest to try and find that out, and I got so many different numbers. One person said 3,000, one person said 7,000. So I don't know what the number is. All I know is that this Bible is full of promises. Maybe the first one is Genesis 3.15, where God promises to send a Savior into the world after the curse of sin coming in. I do know that the last one is Revelation 22.20, where it says, hey, I come, and I am coming quickly. Right? Jesus Christ, words in red. Over the last few weeks, we had so much rain. So much rain. And at our house, we know to be expected of something beautiful. Because if the sun comes out, we are going to see a rainbow. I guarantee you that. We have, been, we have seen some of the most beautiful rainbows over the last few weeks. And they're always double rainbows. You get this <laughs> nice, big, thick one. On the bottom, it's got all the colors, and then on top you see this faint light one. But we see these rainbows, and that is a fulfillment of God's promise. It's a reminder that God is keeping His promise that never again will He destroy all creation with a global flood. And so He set this bow in the sky to give us that reminder. We're keeping that rainbow, too. We ain't giving that up to nobody. <laughs> it means one thing and one thing only. And that means God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen? That's right. Nobody's taking that rainbow from me. They can't have it. Now, sometimes the promises of God are all we have. You know, this has been a tough time. It's been a wild and wacky 2020. We've had so many people in quarantine, so many people alone. You know, my heart goes out to the elderly who have been in nursing homes, not able to have loved ones come and to visit them, having to look at them through windows. No physical human touch. We need that touch. We need our hands held. We need a, a hand on our shoulders. We need hugs and kisses. We have to have that. And they've not had that. And all that they have had is the promises of God. They have stood strong on God's promises. You know, there are times in our lives we hit those valleys, and it seems like nothing is going our way, and the future that it ever will looks bleak. But God says, you can rely on my promise. Stand firm on my promise. Because I am a faithful and just God, and I will keep my promises the Bible says that God does not break any promise that he keeps, but he always fulfills them in his time. David kept his promise to Jonathan when he restored things to his son, Mephibosheth. And God <laughs> wants us also to be people of our word and to keep our promises. And that's not always a thing to do, an easy thing to do. But folks, we represent the most high God. We represent the king of all creation. We represent the one and only God who cared so deeply about us that he would come into our lives, knock on the door of our hearts, and to save us from a fiery hell. Have we forgotten about hell? We were spared from the doom. A separation, an eternal separation from God. Folks, that is a real thing. Don't forget that. It's easy to talk about the kindness of God, but we have been saved from an eternal damnation. We have been lifted out of the fire and into paradise based upon our faith. And that is a cause of great joy and great celebration that you and I, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, now have the peace and assurance and confidence to know, hey, I've got a home. I've got a home with God. Praise God for that. He is a good and loving God. And his promises he will always keep. Once David decided to keep his promise, 
He then sought out the descendants of Jonathan. King David went out and he said, hey, is there anyone yet alive in the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to? He had to go off and he had to seek. There was a young three-year-old boy in January of 2019 by the name of Casey Hathaway. He went missing from his North Carolina home. And for three days, they could not find this three-year-old boy. And the temperatures had reached down into the 20s. And in one night, they had two inches of rain. So things were looking very bleak for young Casey. They sent a search party. All of the state troops, all of the federal troops, they put an all-points bulletin out for this young kid. And they combed the entire perimeter of where he might have traveled in just three short days. When David went and sought out people from the house of Saul, he found Mephibosheth. When authorities went out and sought that three-year-old boy, they found him alive and well. When God came and sought us out, he found us. And he delivered us from trouble. Jesus said, I come to seek and save that which is lost. You and I were once lost, but now we are found. You and I had no hope. We were in the woods. We were in the wilderness. Lost from our Father. But he went out and he Praise God. Hallelujah. What a loving God that he would come and look for a sinner such as I. Like Mephibosheth said, who am I that you would come for a dead dog like me? Have you ever felt like that dead dog? Because that's what we were, a part of the love of Jesus Christ. Seek the heart of God. Chase after his heart. <clears throat> he will leave the 99. He will seek the one. A wonderful God he served. After seeking out Mephibosheth, David then said things in their proper order. God is a God of order. Okay, this is not a God of chaos. I guarantee you when we walk into the kingdom of heaven, there will not be clutter everywhere. There will not be piles of junk. There will not be things everywhere. Go home and clean off your dresser. <laughs> Just kidding. Mine's not so good. But God is a God of order. Now, when David went off to seek Mephibosheth, he said things straight. See, Seba had taken all of the inheritance for himself. And David says, not so fast, Seba. You and your sons and your servants will now be servants to Mephibosheth. You and your sons and your servants who are living high on the hog, who are living high and mighty, who have wrongfully taken what does not belong to you, are now going to be cultivating the land and bringing in the produce for Mephibosheth. Na 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 boo. <laughs> How's that for having the tables turn? Right? God came in and he put things in order. He set things straight. And God does the same thing for us. You know, when God created us, he created us perfect, without flaw, without sin. It was a perfect creation, a perfect world. Everything had its perfect and beautiful order. And we messed it up with some bad choices. And now we toil and we labor, right? And we 
groan deep inside with groanings and longing to be with our God and to be with our Savior. But God sought us out and he said, I will set things straight. I will set things in order. I will send my son, Jesus Christ, and he will make atonement for the penalty of sin. And he will set things straight. You will be a fellow heir with my son, Jesus Christ. And you will have what I have. Because I desire to give you all that I have. This is what God says. I will set things straight. I am not going to let Satan take what doesn't belong to him. Satan was in the garden and he was playing the part of Siva. He said, I am going to steal from God what doesn't belong to me. And he tried to steal you. And he tried to steal you. But God said, you can't have them because I love them. And I want them for myself. I want you for me. And he sent Jesus Christ to die in our place to take the penalty of our sin. And he set things straight. And aren't you glad he did it? I know I am. You know, if you ever watch a small child play with toys. Some of them will take those little cars and they'll go bang, 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 and they'll just be everywhere. And then some kids will take those cars and they'll line them up. <laughs> <laughs> they'll even separate them out by size and color. And just these little kids, you know, two years old, their minds, the way they were. They are putting things in order. That's what God does. He is putting things in order. Is going to restore them to their proper place. With things in their proper order, David was now free to give. And boy, give abundantly, did he not? David came in, and not only did he give Mephibosheth what rightfully belonged to him, the inheritance of his grandfather, King Saul, but David said, Mephibosheth, not only do you get the inheritance, not only do you get the produce of the land, but my friend, you will come and eat regularly at my table. The king's table. The lame dead dog gets to come and eat at the king's table. That was me. The lame, dead dog. No hope. No future. No love. Jesus Christ changed my life. He gave me a future and a hope. And an everlasting hope. And he said, Nick, you lame, dead dog. I love you. I want you and he said the same thing to your heart, too. And even now, he is speaking to the lost. He is saying, I love you, and I want you. Come and be with me. Come and eat at the king's table. God gave abundantly. And the giving doesn't stop. When we put our salvation, our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Because God continues to give. And oftentimes it hurts when He gives. You see, the Lord is building us up and training us. You know how the scripture says, train a child up in the way that he should go, and surely he will not depart from it. Well, as God's children, He does the same for us. And it oftentimes hurts. And we struggle. But he is there. And so today I want to bring comfort to you in knowing that God is with you. 
God is behind you, ready to pay the bill for the money that you don't have. That cheeseburger is yours. Okay? Those fries are yours. And in moments when it feels like we have nothing to eat, and in moments where it feels like God has forgotten us, I want you to take courage, congregation. I want you to keep faith, people. I want you to know he is training you up in the way of the Lord. Because this right here is temporary. This is only a short piece of time. Boy, I tell you, as the years go by, and I'm 42 now, and I see my parents in their 60s, and I see things, I'm like, where is the time going? And then I get a better understanding and knowing that this is short. This is temporary. This is a speck of dust in all eternity. That's it. A speck of dust. Because have you, have you thought about eternity? We're going to spend eternity in heaven, and it's forever, and forever, and forever, and forever, and forever. And it has no end. And that's beautiful. Is that not beautiful? That God would be able to supply us with so much joy and entertainment that we would have that forever. David gave abundantly. But David did not stop at giving. He goes all the way. He goes all the way and he brings Mephibosheth in as one of the king's sons. David comes in and he says, you are going to sit at my table. You are going to eat with me regularly just as one of the king's sons. And I, I bet Jonathan was looking down on this saying, David... Man, I love you. I love you so much that you, you kept your promise to me. You are treating my son as your own son. You have brought him into Jerusalem where he can share at your table. You have restored order, administered justice, shown him the kindness of God. Oh, David. David, 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 thank you so much. This was the intention of God from the get-go. To make you a child of God. We were created and designed to be children of the Most High King. You know, I read a story recently about embryos. Right? Frozen embryos. And they call them snowflakes. So when you hear the term snowflakes and you think, well, that's this young generation that don't want to do nothing, right? That's not the case. And that's not everybody, okay? We got some young people in here like, hey, watch it. They're catching you out in the parking lot. No so, uh, thanks. Snowflakes. And what happens is, as you guys are familiar with embryonic stem cell research, right? You've heard that term. And so what they'll do is they will mass produce these embryos because they will use that embryonic stem cells because they're very uh, versatile and they're able to adapt easily and they can help heal a lot of things. But those extra embryos are kept away and frozen. And it's like life. It's just locked away, frozen. Well, there's now a program where people can adopt those embryos and they call them snowflakes. And I was reading up on this, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of babies that are born from this program. People go and adopt embryos, and they have children. Boy, and that, that blew my mind. Because I thought, have we gotten to a place that we have in our society, in our culture, where we actually think we are so smart, knowledgeable, and intellectually high on our horse. Well, I'm telling you, we just don't know anything. You know, Don mentioned it last week. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And that is so true. But here we are. We're just a people. We chase after knowledge. Chase after knowledge. It doesn't get you anywhere with God. Yeah, it's good to know. We have got to know about God, right? And we will learn things. But the knowledge of God comes through chasing His heart. And here we are, we are setting up factories of embryos, of babies. And we do things like this. Just create life. Lock 
get away. And we take life out of the womb. Because we're so smart. Because we know what's best. Because we are man. You know, they did the same thing at Babel. All throughout history, it's been the same thing. We know better than God. We know what's best. And God says, reality check. Not the case. <clears throat> Aren't you glad, though, that God hasn't locked us away in the freezer? That God hasn't abandoned us to our destiny? But that he looked upon us, had mercy, and said, I am making you my child, and you are going to sit with me at the king's table. And folks, you have a date. You have an appointment with God. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you are going to sit at that table. And you are going to enjoy a feast at the king's table with the king of the universe and the king of all creation. Now, if that's not worthy of an amen, I don't know what is. Amen. Thank you. Well done. Good and faithful servants, and that is what you are. You are God's. God loves you. And I know 2020 has been wild and wild. And sometimes scary. But let me give you these words. You are a child of God. And he has you securely in his hand. And he will not allow you to stumble. And he will not allow anyone to snatch you out of his hand. Don't go by the feelings. Go by the promises. And the promise says, I have you, and you are mine. What a wonderful thing David has demonstrated us today in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I had never heard of Matthew Boshet before. And when I read this passage, I said, wow, thank you, Lord, for letting me see this about this unknown man and the way that David demonstrated your kindness. What we can do now is we can demonstrate God's kindness by following the example of David and remembering that God wants us to demonstrate this type of kindness in the world. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, you are a wonderfully compassionate and patient God of mercy and love. Thank you for always illuminating our minds and filling our hearts with your words of Scripture. The words that can never be destroyed, the words that will never go away. <clears throat> Ask whether the flower fades, the word of God in your prayer. Father, I pray that you will send this people on with joy in their hearts and that consuming fire of faith. We thank you. Praise your name in Jesus' name. If you would now at this time, just shortly keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, I know that this is a time where some hearts may be a time where there may be a reckoning of the soul. Father, I ask that there be anyone here among us today that needs your salvation, that needs Jesus Christ as a Savior of their life. I pray, Father God, they would take advantage of this opportunity. If we've learned nothing else in these past few months of 2020, we have learned to expect the unexpected. We have learned that life here on earth can end over at any time. Then, a judgment. Father, I ask that if there be anyone here today, 
their hearts be made tender, and they would come to you to sit at the table.